Recently on Instagram, I put up a story asking people what their assumptions were about neurosurgeons. Because one of the whole points of starting BrainBook was that I felt that there was a lot of anxiety and negative stereotyping about neurosurgery and neurosurgeons in general. So some of the responses were actually quite funny. There were some general themes running through them and I thought with this vlog we'd start talking about some of those main themes, exploring them and trying to debunk them. So, you know, some of them are really sweet things to say and thank you. They're most caring and smart doctors, an eye for detail, cool-headed, being able to put emotion aside when needed, no shaky hands. They have no time to have a family. My wife thinks we're all rude. They don't have time for their families. They feel like God himself. What if God's a girl? We've got female neurosurgeons too. You work immensely long hours and hardly get any time to spend with your family. Always the smartest in school or uni. They're all arrogant. And my own mentee, Mattia, thinks that I'm a psychopath. So I thought I'd make a little video focusing on being a psychopath and whether neurosurgeons are all psychopaths. So without further ado, let's get to it. So the reason why I want to focus on the, the whole point about psychopathy in general is because I think that it'll cover arrogance, which got quite a lot of comments saying that neurosurgeons are arrogant. It'll cover the God complex thing. Um, I had two or three comments saying that neurosurgeons have a God complex. It will also cover the theme of being emotionless or cold hearted or being able to detach yourself completely. So the first thing that we need to do when we talk about whether neurosurgeons are psychopaths is what is the definition of a psychopath? And luckily, there is a psychopathy index that helps you diagnose a real psychopath. There are common stereotypes in the media about what this kind of personality involves. A lot of you who are UK-based or even American may have watched Killing Eve and be familiar with the character of Villanelle. And I've definitely worked with some people who have all of her characteristics and even act like her at work. Important things are to note that she's very good at what she does, which is admittedly murdering people, and she is super cold and calculating and disconnected from reality. So the Psychopathic Personality Inventory has eight subdivisions, and one of the first ones is called Machiavellian Egocentricity. Now to understand what that means, you need to know who Niccolo Machiavelli was. He was an Italian diplomat back in the 16th century who became famous for writing a book called The Prince which was published five years after his death. The Prince was really famous for explaining how to achieve your goal within politics and as a diplomat and as a ruler. The whole point of Machiavellianism and the Prince is that it doesn't matter what you have to do to achieve power or to maintain power, you just do it. Anything is a means to an end, whether that is killing innocent people, using an iron hand, subterfuge, being really devious and cunning. So if you're trying to apply Machiavellianism and Machiavellian egocentricity to a surgeon, they don't tally up that well. I'm quite happy to be able to say that I don't know many surgeons now that do what they do to boost and fuel their own ego. There's no role for it in the modern NHS, and Machiavellian tactics and personalities are generally becoming more and more frowned upon as time goes by. There are still surgeons with egos out there, not just neurosurgeons, but they're becoming more and more of a minority. So let's put that one to the side. The second one is something called social potency, which is being super charming in order to get what you want. Surgeons can be charmers, they may have something in their character called charisma, which is being able to influence others towards your own end. I'm not sure that surgery naturally attracts charismatic people, but a lot of surgeons certainly can be good talkers and charismatic and be very good at influencing people. Again, it's a skill that you might see in modern health services where people are vying for theatre space to get their operations done for their patients. You might have to be a little bit charming, but again, it's always done to, in a patient's best interests. The third thing is fearlessness. And that's 
An eagerness to take risk without any kind of concern about whether it's going to cause harm. Now, what you've got to remember is that before we become surgeons, we're doctors. And as doctors, we all take an oath to do no harm. Neurosurgeons are not inherently risk takers. We carry out risky procedures, but it's really important to understand that we select our patients and we select an operation that will suit their problem so that we're minimizing risk as much as possible. The stakes in neurosurgery are so high, and I've talked about this previously in the Bad Outcomes vlog, that you need to do everything you can to minimize risk. So I don't think that neurosurgeons will all fulfill that characteristic. And I know most of my peers are not eager to take risk, but will certainly take on high risk cases if that's going to be in the patient's best interests. Cold heartedness is another part of this, another subdivision. But the way it's described in the psychopathy index is that you're guiltless, callous, and you're completely shut off to other people's emotions and distress. In a high stakes specialty like neurosurgery, there is a lot of breaking bad news. Things can go wrong despite good operations and best intentions you can very frequently be breaking bad news to patients and their relatives. If you're completely emotionally invested every single time that you do that, you're going to really, really struggle to shut off and you're going to start to feel extremely stressed and burned out. A lot of doctors and a lot of surgeons and a lot of neurosurgeons will be able to compartmentalize their feelings and emotions to a particular situation and deal with it later but what that may appear as on the surface is that we don't care and that we're completely callous, disinterested and have no hearts. That is absolutely not true. Otherwise, we wouldn't be doing the job that we do. Impulse nonconformity means that we're unconventional, reckless. Like I said before, you can't be reckless in neurosurgery. The next one is carefree non-planfulness. And that's a bit of a mishmash of words, but it essentially means that you don't think ahead. Neurosurgery is not a specialty where you can afford to not think ahead. Every operation that we do is meticulously planned. Everything from positioning the patient on the operating table, choosing the approach, planning the skin incision, knowing what you're going to use, and planning for any consequences and eventualities during the operation. It all requires a stupendous amount of forethought. So you can brush that one to the side. Blame externalization. So that's blaming other people when bad things happen. As we're learning a lot more about human factors, we're realizing that a lot of the time, no one person can be, no one person can be put to blame for, for a mistake, unless it's obvious harm to a patient that's been done deliberately. When you work in a really large system like the National Health Service, there are so many different parts of the system that can fail that contribute to somebody being harmed. And as neurosurgeons, we're very good at taking ownership for our patients and the outcomes of their operations. We don't cast blame on other people because that's not how a modern health service can work. It's important to find out where things have gone wrong and try to fix them, but blaming other people doesn't work. And finally, stress immunity. All doctors have to deal with stress from day one through to the end of their career. At the beginning, you're not very good at it because of a lack of experience and a lack of knowledge. As you get more experienced and gain more knowledge, you can become less stressed in certain scenarios. The problem with neurosurgery is that a lot of the situations that we deal with, especially on call, are life and death scenarios, which obviously stress you massively very quickly. I, for example, was really, really stressed being on call and having something like a code black, which is a life or death situation coming in. I'd feel really out of my depth. I always had senior support, but it doesn't mean that I didn't feel very anxious dealing with it. As time has gone on, I don't think twice about things like code blacks and life and death scenarios. I internalize it and deal with the stress of it later. And it's important to have your own coping mechanisms and own systems to deal with it. As neurosurgeons, we have to develop those coping mechanisms really quickly. Otherwise, you're not going to survive in the specialty. This is supposed to be a relatively short vlog. Hope you've enjoyed it. Hope you've managed to learn something from it. We've talked about neurosurgeons being psychopaths. So hopefully, you'll be able to take away from this that we're not all psychopaths. See you next time.